Good evening. I'm Dr. William Burnett. I'm a child psychiatrist and forensic psychiatrist in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's great to see so many people here this evening uh, at this webinar. And as usual, we want to thank Elaine Cobb for organizing this web webinar that happens every month. So I have a pretty complicated title, which is on this first uh, title slide, which says, it's time to make history together. Parental alienation relational problem and DSM-5 TR. So um, I'm gonna try to explain exactly what this is all about. And I'm gonna explain what you can do to help me and we can all together make history. So as you can see on this next slide are, are the two main components of what I'm talking about today. That first of all, I'm gonna be describing uh, the, a diagnostic version of parental alienation. And what we're calling it is Parental Alienation Relational Problem or PARP. And I'll explain why we're using that. And then uh, you can see this is a little picture of the DSM-5TR. And th th those are the initials for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition text revision. So most of you probably know in the next slide that the, uh, the actual words parental alienation are not in the DSM, but the idea, the concept of PARP, P-A-R-P, is in the DSM already. And it's there, there are three diagnoses in the DSM which can be used in a case where parental alienation is present. And the first one of these is child affected by parental relationship distress. That's a very cumbersome title, but it's C-A-P-R-D. The second diagnosis that's already in the DSM is parent-child relational problem. And the third one is child psychological abuse. So what this means is even now, if a person is doing an evaluation, if a psychologist or social worker or psychiatrist is doing an evaluation on a family, and they identify parental alienation, they can use one of these diagnoses that are already in the DSM. But what we would like to do is to have a more specific diagnosis that particular that uh, especially pertains specifically pertains to parental alienation. And here's our proposed definition of PARP, parental alienation relational problem. This is the definition that we've been using for years uh, with regard to parental alienation. Now let's read this together. This category may be used when a child, usually one whose parents are engaged in a high conflict, separation, or divorce, allies strongly with one parent and rejects a relationship with the other parent without a good reason. So, uh, that's just the one sentence definition, but in the uh, PARP, we explained that there are five criteria. The diagnosis of PARP usually requires these five criteria. And let's run through these together. The child avoids, resists, or refuses a relationship with one of the parents. There previously in the past was a good positive relationship between the child and the parent who is now rejected. Thirdly, there's an absence of abuse, neglect, or seriously deficient parenting on the part of the parent who is now rejected. Fourth, there, it's possible to identify multiple alienating behaviors on the part of the favored parent. And finally, the fifth uh, criterion for the diagnosis of PARP is the identification of behavioral signs of alienation by the child. So these five criteria were published only a few months ago in an article called The Five-Factor Model for the Diagnosis of Parental Alienation. Now, uh, Dr. Amy Baker and I have been talking about these five factors for several years, and there have been articles and, and book chapters uh, discussing it for a long time. But 
um, it was important that these that this uh, article was published in an important journal, the um, Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. So that was only a few months ago. And in fact, that's part of the reason why we're now ready to present uh, this idea that PARC should be included in the DSM because there have been a number of important publications in the last year or so. So I wanna show you several ways that we've been uh, promoting this idea. And the first one uh, is I wanna show you uh, the website. Uh, we're gonna uh, go to the, um, we have a dedicated website, which is www.parp hyphen dsm.info. And later, uh, when you have a chance, you can go to this website and we're gonna go to it right now. And on the website, we're gonna scroll down a little bit to a video. So we have a really neat video uh, that you can, uh, we're gonna show right now, but also you can see it yourself if you go to the website. And this video was made by a colleague of ours, Larry DeMarco, who's an attorney in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia. And he is, uh, his office is called the Law Center. So Larry has made a number of videos and let's look at this one. This is a kind of a neat overview of what happens um, in, in, with regard to PARP and the DSM. This video proposes that parental alienation be considered a relational problem in the chapter of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is called Other Conditions That May Be a Focus of Clinical Attention. This is the proposed wording for parental alienation relational problem. This category may be used when a child, usually one whose parents are engaged in a high conflict separation or divorce, allies strongly with one parent and rejects a relationship with the other parent without good reason. The diagnosis of parental relational problem usually requires five criteria. One, the child avoids, resists, or refuses a relationship with a parent. Two, the presence of a prior positive relationship between the child and the now rejected parent. Three, the absence of abuse or neglect or seriously deficient parenting on the part of the now rejected parent. Four, the use of multiple alienating behaviors by the favored parent. And five, manifestations of behavioral signs of alienation by the child. These five criteria are called the five-factor model for the diagnosis of parental alienation. The justifications for the proposed addition. For the child, it's painful to be caught in the battleground between their parents. For the alienated parent, it's humiliating, traumatic, and extremely frustrating to be irrationally rejected by a child with whom they previously had an enjoyable, loving relationship. Mental health practitioners, legal professionals, both attorneys and judges, and alienated parents have all described the relentless progression of parental alienation from a mild level of intensity when it's reversible, to a severe level when it's almost intractable. Adopting a formal definition for parental alienation will greatly increase the chances of its early detection, and more intensive research will hopefully lead to prevention of this painful mental condition. Historical context for this proposal. Although the actual words, parental alienation, weren't included in the DSM-5, the concept of parental alienation was included in three different diagnoses in the chapter on other conditions. Each of these diagnoses paraphrased the meaning of parental alienation in their respective definitions. First, child affected by parental relationship distress. Negative effects of parental relationship discord on a child in the family. For example, high levels of conflict, distress, or disparagement. Two, parent-child relational problem. 
negative attributions of the other's intentions, or hostility toward the other, and unwarranted feelings of estrangement. Three, child psychological abuse. That is, harming or abandoning people or things that the child cares about. The great majority of practitioners who are familiar with parental alienation agree on the basic principles of the theory. There may be disagreements on how to distinguish mild, moderate, and severe levels of parental alienation. There may be disagreements regarding the interventions for these levels of severity. But these disagreements aren't essential for the inclusion of parental alienation in the DSM-5. In fact, many conditions are included in the DSM for which there's a disagreement regarding treatment. The magnitude of the proposed addition. Jennifer Harmon and her colleagues recently published a comprehensive review of the parental alienation literature. The authors identified more than a thousand articles and books that pertained primarily to parental alienation theory. Excluding the material that contained no data, they ultimately reviewed in detail 207 empirical research studies. The following graph demonstrates how qualitative and quantitative research regarding parental alienation theory has increased over time. More than 100 books have been published regarding parental alienation, most of them written by psychiatrists, psychologists, and other mental health professionals. Some were written by alienated parents or formerly alienated children describing their lived experiences. Peer-reviewed publications regarding parental alienation have appeared in the professional literature in more than 50 countries. There's a worldwide need for inclusion of parental alienation in the DSM-5. Practitioners and researchers in many countries will benefit from standardized definitions and diagnostic criteria for this mental condition. If practitioners identify and understand parental alienation, they will be able to help children and families who are struggling with this mental condition. There's a great deal of quantitative research regarding alienating behaviors, which is factor four of the five-factor model, and the behavioral manifestations of parental alienation, which is factor five of the five-factor model. The acceptability of the concept of parental alienation can be addressed in four ways. One, large professional organizations have accepted the general concept of parental alienation. The large professional organizations that accept parental alienation include the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the AACAP, the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, the AFCC, the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, the AAML, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP. Many professional organizations have accepted papers and symposiums regarding parental alienation at conferences for mental health and legal professionals. Two, major textbooks and reference books have published information regarding parental alienation. For instance, the Comprehensive Textbook of Psychiatry, the Encyclopedia of Forensic Science, and the Encyclopedia of Clinical Psychology. Three, a great majority of practitioners have accepted the general concept of parental alienation and the definitions of specific components of parental alienation theory. In one study, researchers surveyed mental health professionals. They rated the importance of 21 factors in shaping custody recommendations. One of the factors was related to parental alienation, which was ranked as the second highest ranking factor. That clearly indicated endorsement of the concept. In another study, the researchers asked custody evaluators their opinions of definitions related to alienation and estrangement. About 90% of the participants agreed on these definitions, including the definition of the five-factor model for the diagnosis of parental alienation. There are several DSM-5 TR diagnoses that may be confused with parental alienation in some circumstances, although these conditions can be distinguished in a careful clinical evaluation. One, child affected by parental alienation distress. Two, parent-child relational problem. Three, child psychological abuse. And four, 
delusional symptoms in the context of relationship with an individual with prominent delusions. Several psychological tests have been found to reliably distinguish alienated from non-alienated children. Some of these instruments were developed specifically for this task. Others were older, established psychological tests that were newly applied to cases involving parental alienation. The following are listed in chronological order. Baker, Burkhart, and Albertson Kelly in 2012. The Baker Alienation Questionnaire, or BAQ, is intended to identify alienated children using a paper and pencil measure that's short, easy to administer, and easy to score objectively. The authors found that the BAQ discriminated between alienated and non-alienated children at an 87.5% accuracy rate. In the table, you can see that the BAQ gave correct results in 35 out of 40 cases. The Rollins Parental Alienation Scale, or RPAS, was administered to 592 parents along with measures of convergent and discriminant validity. The RPAS consists of six factors. One, campaign of denigration toward the alienated parent. Two, independent thinker phenomenon. Three, reflexive support of the favored parent. Four, presence of borrowed scenarios. Five, spread of animosity to extended family of rejected parent. And six, lack of positive effect toward the rejected parent. Parents who reported either that a court evaluation or court findings had confirmed the presence of parental alienation scored significantly higher on all six RPAS factors as well as on the overall RPAS score. Burnett et al. 2018 and 2020. The Parental Acceptance and Rejection Questionnaire or PARQ PARC was administered to 45 severely alienated children and 71 non-alienated children in Canada. It was found that severely alienated children engage in extreme level of splitting. That is, perceive the favored parent in very positive terms and the rejected parent in exclusively negative terms. The park gap, the difference between the child's park for the mother and park for the father scores, was 99% accurate in distinguishing alienated from non-alienated children. In the graph, you can see the park distinguished the alienated children in red from the non-alienated children in blue. Blag and Godfrey, 2018. The Ben Anthony Family Relations Test, or BAFRT, was administered to 16 alienated children and 17 non-alienated children in the United Kingdom. Children in the alienated group expressed almost exclusively negative feelings toward the rejected parent, while expressing almost exclusively positive feelings toward the preferred parent. These highly significant results are summarized in this table. An unusual feature of this topic is the extreme amount of misinformation that's been created by critics of parental alienation theory over the years. This information, which was expressed in various forms, has been methodically clarified and refuted by proponents of parental alienation theory in book chapters and in peer-reviewed journals. Nonetheless, the proponents of false information continue to make inaccurate and inflammatory claims about the topic. Critics of parental alienation theory are likely to protest vigorously to this proposal. We urge DSM personnel to consider the writings of parental alienation critics in a careful and somewhat skeptical manner and to distinguish factual material from the false information and misinformation that may be found there. Conclusion in the United States, there are hundreds of thousands of children and families that have experienced parental alienation. It's our belief that most of these cases of parental alienation go undetected and untreated simply because the serious mental condition is not well known among psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and other mental health professionals and because of the misinformation that's been disseminated about it. 
In some instances, the process of alienation is even encouraged by naive and poorly informed therapists and lawyers. This unfortunate state of affairs will continue until parental alienation is recognized by leading mental health organizations and then filtered down to the frontline practitioners. The most direct method for accomplishing that goal is for parental alienation to be accepted as a relational problem in the DSM-5-TR, which will lead to educational programs for graduate students and trainees, as well as continuing education for practicing mental health and legal professionals. The Parental Alienation Relational Problem and DSM-5 proposal was developed by Dr. William Burnett and Dr. Amy J. L. Baker. For additional information, including the complete proposal document, visit www.parp-dsm.info. Go to the description portion of this video for the complete proposal and to learn more about the Law Center, the producer of this video. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, if you if you want more information about all this, you should go back to the website and on the website, you can read the entire proposal that we will be submitting in a few weeks to uh, the DSM. And also there are a number of appendices that you can look at and also the list of endorsers. We now have about 2000 more than 2000 people and organizations have endorsed this proposal and. Um, you can see the list actually on the website. And also there are links on the website so that if you're interested, if you think this is a good idea, you can uh, sign in and add your name and your location. And we will add you to the list of endorsers for this project. So once again, I wanna thank Larry DeMarco who made this video and uh, the law center. So, um, this is one approach. In other words, this video is an informal sort of folksy uh, way to present this topic. And I think it, it's the kind of thing that the general public can understand. It's, it's pretty succinct, it gives an overview, it hits the main points. But we, we of course, have used other uh, approaches too. And just recently, uh, I did something at the uh, annual meeting of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and that we had a booth, you know, in a big convention, they have an exhibit hall and they have uh, uh, booths by various organizations. And um, the, um, what we did, um, my organization, PASG, Parental Alienation Study Group, we rented a booth and we arranged uh, to have this poster, as you can see, uh, the poster itself gives the, the definition that we're proposing for the, uh, the diagnosis of PARP, and it also gives the name of the website. And it, there's even a what's called a QR, a quick response, that people walking by or coming to the, to, the, um, uh, to the booth can simply hold up their phone and it will take them to the, the way to uh, log in their endorsement. So I guess my idea here is that um, we, uh, we, we have different approaches. You know, we have a, an approach that's more suitable for the general public. We have an approach that perhaps is more suitable for uh, psychiatrists and other mental health professionals and so on. So we hope to reach a lot of people. And in fact, I really appreciate this opportunity right now to reach you all uh, with regard to this campaign. So I really appreciate it that a number of people in the audience have posed questions and we're gonna go through several and I hope to uh, be able to answer some of them. I don't think I'm able to do all of them, but I, I can do some of them. And here's it, let's, let's read this next question. Uh, let's read this together. Uh, that's on the slide. What is the diagnosis being used by trained psychologists Here, let me look at this better. All right, trained psychologists that are doing custody evaluations currently. 
when getting mine done, they said they could not mention the word parental alienation in my reports because it is unrecognized and not in the DSM. And there are other terms for it that were acceptable and mean the same thing. Well, of course, that's exactly what we're trying to address. We're trying to get parental alienation in the DSM so that in the future, when people do evaluations, they will be able to um, actually use that term. But the answer to their question was actually in the video that I just showed you, that there are three different diagnoses, as mentioned in the video, that uh, even now, an evaluator can use if, if they have a case involving parental alienation. And those three diagnoses are child affected by parental relationship distress, or CAPRD, parent-child relational problem, and child psychological abuse. So here's another question. Let's read this together. Uh, it starts out in a provocative way. So what is the psychoalienator diagnosed with? It is far more important to diagnose the root of the problem. These children need protection from a mentally unstable parent who is causing their child psychosis. So th this, this actually raises a good point, which is that the, the, the diagnosis of PARP actually pertains to the child, but there are ways to diagnose the, per the perpetrator. And there are a number of different diagnoses, but when you're doing an evaluation, it depends on who is the focus of the evaluation. And I have on this slide, if the focus of clinical attention is on the child and the child's relationship with the, re with the targeted or rejected parent, then the diagnosis should be PARP, parental alienation relational problem. But if the focus of the evaluation or the focus of clinical attention is on the alienating parent, then there are, there are several diagnoses that, that might be appropriate. One is child psychological abuse, which is already in the DSM. Or if the person has personality disorder, for instance, some, some parents have narcissistic personality disorder, that would be the diagnosis. Or in, in really severe cases where the person actually is psychotic or delusional, there's a diagnosis in the DSM specifically for that. So uh, I think uh, the, the, the DSM is pretty flexible as to applying different diagnoses for different purposes, but we think it'll be even better when PARP is included. So here's another question on the next slide. Is there any way you can include grandparent alienation in the request to DSM-5 personnel along with parent alienation? I'm a PhD candidate in depth psychology, and I would love to see you make history in escorting in not only parent alienation into the DSM-5, but also grandparent alienation. So that's a great suggestion. We do allude to that in the proposal, we do mention that it's not just parents, but grandparents and other people who are rejected. But um, I think we can expand on that and uh, make that a little bit more explicit. So thank you for whoever made that suggestion and, and to remind us to do that. Um, that's great. So on the next slide is another question. I would like to know if there is any literature or research that helps formulate the diagnosis of parental alienation prior to divorce and what tools are needed to establish the diagnosis early. So that's good to try to figure that out. And what we have done, uh, we've created levels of parental alienation and typically they're called mild, moderate, and severe. And sometimes, uh, the person who asked the question is right. Sometimes the alienation starts even before the people split up, the parents split up or, or the divorce occurs. And sometimes it starts at birth that the uh, one parent, and I guess that would typically be the mother, might be so protective of the child that she uh, totally takes control of the child even at birth. Um, 
to the exclusion of the other parent. And obviously this is prior to any divorce that eventually happens. So uh, incidentally, uh, when that happens, that's actually an exception. This is a nuance to the five factor model. And as you recall, the second factor was that prior to the onset of alienation, the parent had a good relationship with the child. But suppose it, it's like in the situation that I just described, suppose the parent took control of the child even at birth and never let the other parent have any relationship at all. Well, I think that might still be a case of parental alienation, perhaps even severe as time goes on, but, but it doesn't fulfill um, the second criterion. So that's, in other words, the, the five-factor model, the five factors usually stand up, but occasionally there are exceptions to some of these factors in, in very specific situations. So what we hope that uh, making people more aware of the diagnosis of PARP, that it will in fact mean that uh, practitioners will identify it earlier rather than later. And of course, uh, that's the whole idea of early intervention is you pick up conditions or you pick up problems when they're mild, when they're relatively easy to make an adjustment or make a correction rather than later. So thank you for that question. Here's one more question I wanna talk about right now. Is there a timeline of PA symptoms in children that can be used to diagnose deterioration over time, going from initial PA symptoms to being completely alienated from a parent, and a parallel timeline of showing what therapy is needed at each stage. So this is a kind of a continuation of the, of the question that we were just discussing, but let me run through this. And this has to do with mild, moderate, and severe levels of alienation. And, and there are, in fact, different interventions for each one. So what is mild? Mild alienation. The child says, let's say it's the daddy who is the alienated parent. The child says, I don't want to go see daddy in a mild case. But the child goes and he's fine. They get along, they have a good time. That once the child gets out of mommy's household and down the street in the car, um, he's fine. So even though he had said, I don't want to go see daddy, in fact, he's fine once he gets there. So that's mild. And what do you do about that? So that can come to the attention of a therapist or a psychologist or a judge even. And, and so in those cases, the parents are simply admonished. The judge tells the parents, hey, look, it looks like there's a problem happening here. We want both of you to shape up and we want both of you to do whatever you can to encourage the, the child to have a good relationship with both parents. And, and um, you know, uh, d d don't do anything to uh, discourage the child from going on parenting time with the other parent. So that's, that's a mild situation. And usually that kind of admonishment is enough to uh, correct that situation when it is mild. So a typical moderate alienation, the, uh, the child says, I don't want to go see daddy. And the child goes, but is difficult. During most of the parenting time, the child is negative, doesn't want to participate, doesn't want to have meals, stays in the room, in their bedroom, perhaps gets on the phone with the mother. If it's the, the mother is back, the alienating preferred parent. And, um, and is negative most of the time. Although in moderate cases, there may be moments like after a day or so, the child might soften up and, and communicate and even uh, have a good time at, uh, for part of the time with, with the rejected parent. So in moderate cases, the child is mostly negative, but there may be moments when things are going okay. And so those cases, uh, there are treatment programs for those cases. And typically they involve everybody, that the child is still living with one parent and having parenting time with the second parent. Both parents need to have coaches. 
I like to call them coaches rather than therapists because the coaches are very active. They basically tell the parent, do this, do this, don't do this. There usually needs to have some sort of therapy or family therapy involved with the children. And there usually needs to have a parenting coordinator. That's a person who meets with both parents together and uh, helps them communicate regarding the child. And then the parenting coordinator is in charge of this whole process with all these different therapists. Also, there's no confidentiality in this type of therapy, but all the therapists have to communicate with each other and they all have to be on the same page. This type of therapy for moderate cases of alienation almost always has to be ordered by a court or else people won't participate. And also, uh, there has to be a way for the parenting coordinator to report back to the court as to progress. So that's what happens in moderate cases. So in severe cases, there almost always has been a severe level of alienating behavior on the part of the favored parent. And there's a severe rejection. Uh, there's a persistent rejection of the targeted parent. And by persistent, I mean that the child refuses to go at all to see that parent. Or if the child goes, the child is negative during the entire parenting time. Um, the child won't come out in the room, their bedroom. They won't have meals. They, they won't watch TV with the parent or anything like that. So we consider uh, severe cases of parental alienation where both the symptoms in the preferred parent and the symptoms in the child are severe, are pervasive, we consider that to be child psychological abuse. And in severe cases like that, we recommend the child needs to re be removed from that household, at least for a while, meaning the child needs to be removed from the favored parent or the alienated parent, at least for a while. And then there has to be some work uh, between the child and the rejected parent so that they, they can live together. Um, but that's, that this, I'm sure there are details to, to these programs, but this is an overview of how to do that. So I've, I've given you the definition that we're proposing for PARP in DSM, and I've answered a few of these questions. We're going to have some more questions later. But what I want to do now is go over the actual arguments that can be used. In other words, on the next slide, we have uh, three of, of the main arguments that are used in our proposal. There's actually, there's a, there's a series of things that if you're making a proposal to the DSM, uh, they tell us um, what they want. There's a series of, um, uh, types of information that they want uh, from people who are proposing changes in the DSM. So I'm going to tell you about three of them. And let's, uh, let's take a look at this little list. Uh, first of all, parental alienation theory is recognized all over the world. Secondly, what I'm going to summarize for you is there's an enormous amount of qualitative and quantitative research uh, regarding PARP. And thirdly, this is something that's interesting that uh, the DSM requires. Is it possible to tell the difference between PARP and other mental disorders that might be somewhat similar? In other words, if you're going to have something in a book of diagnoses, you have to be able to distinguish this diagnosis from all the others. So here, take a look at this next kind of heading slide, there's these two little children in a picture. And, and uh, what I wanna talk about initially here is that parental alienation theory has been observed all over the world. And in the next slide is this really impressive list of countries. Uh, I think there are 50 countries now. And we've been collecting uh, literature regarding parental alienation for a number of years. And we have gradually uh, collected. Uh, this is liter This is material from the professional literature 
of all of these countries. And by that, I mean, I'm not talking about newspaper articles or blogs on the internet or magazine stories. I'm talking about um, journals intended for attorneys or psychologists or psychiatrists or other mental health professionals. So it is pretty amazing that the same phenomena of parental alienation has been described in South America, in Africa, obviously in many countries in Europe, in Asia and Australia and so on. So um, that's, that's a point that we make to the people at DSM that, that this, this isn't a rare unknown phenomenon. This is well known and has been described in many, many countries. So that's the first topic. It's well known in many countries. The second topic um, is you can see this picture of this little boy and girl again. And this is, I want to summarize that there is an abundant amount of empirical research. So that's one of the requirements to get something in the DSM. And I want to make sure you're aware of a really important article that was also published only a few months ago it's called Developmental Psychology and the Scientific Status of Parental Alienation. So this is a huge study that was done by Jennifer Harmon, Richard Warshak, uh, Demosthenes Lorandos, and, and some other people, in which they pulled together uh, hundreds of research articles that pertain to alienation. Now, I mentioned that there are articles from all over these different countries. Most of these articles are descriptive. In other words, they don't involve uh, numbers. They don't involve quantitative research. But even that, most of the hundreds of them are descriptive of this phenomenon. But what Harmon and her colleagues did out of those thousand, there's more than a thousand, that, that they found 213 articles that describe actual quantitative research. Uh, where somebody has studied a specific aspect of alienation in a quantitative statistical manner. And I'm gonna give you some examples of that in a few minutes. But in this next slide is an overview of uh, how this research has occurred as uh, over, I guess, 30 years or so. And the, the head of this slide said, it says enormous qualitative and quantitative research, but it shows this graph. And as you can see, um, it starts maybe 30 years ago. And then the, the number, it shows the number of qualitative and quantitative studies that have been published. And one of the uh, most notable things is that when, when a new topic is being uh, written about, most of the articles are qualitative, meaning they're simply descriptive like all those articles from those countries I mentioned. But as time goes on, there are more and more quantitative research studies regarding that topic. And that's exactly what has happened with regard to parental alienation. Now, I wanna mention um, some specific research about the four-factor model and the five-factor model. So, I've already told you the five factors. Well, the four factor model is exactly the same thing, except it doesn't have that very first factor, which is uh, the child rejects one of the parents. So years ago, Dr. Baker started writing articles and uh, publishing material about the four factors. But as time went on, we thought it would be a good idea to add factor one and she agreed. So, so now we have her four factors plus the first factor, which is a, a basic principle that the child is rejecting one of the parents. And that's why we now have five factor model. But both of these factors, both of these models have been studied in quantitative research. For instance, in the uh, research study on the four factor model, uh, Dr. Baker gave a vignettes to a number of mental health professionals. And then the, the vignettes varied as to whether or not the four factors were present or absent or so on. And she found uh, 
systematic agreement. That is, that if all four factors were present, the, the evaluator said this is a case of alienation. If no factor or only one factor was present, then the evaluator said, no, this is not a case of alienation in this vignette. So th what does that mean? Statistically, that means that there was a high level of reliability in this research project regarding the four-factor model. Well, last year, an another colleague, Stephen Morrison, uh, did a similar study using all five factors. And so he presented a series of vignettes with five factors to a number of um, practitioners. And he had them write whether or not um, alienation was present. And as you can see, there, there's some statistics in this next slide. It says six vignettes were presented and they provided responses for each of the five criteria. And then th th there are ways to measure uh, whether or not the evaluators agree. And there was a very high agreement among the evaluators as to the presence of uh, parental alienation in these vignettes. So I'm, gi I'm giving you these examples of how research can be done on parental alienation theory. And in the next topic, I, I wanna continue this and explain that there are objective tests for alienation. So this comes up sometimes when people criticize parental alienation theory, they say, oh, well, it's all just subjective. It's just up to the evaluator to figure this out. What actually, what we're presenting to the DSM is that there are several objective tests for parental alienation. And, and uh, the first one is this test developed by Dr. Amy Baker and published in 2012. And the name of her article was Differentiating Alienated from Non-Alienated Children, a Pilot Study. So that's the whole point of this type of research is can you give a, little, a fairly simple test to a child, a little questionnaire, and is it possible to, to, to score the test and that that would help you tell, help the evaluator tell whether the child is alienated or not. Now, I, did, I need to warn you, nobody is gonna suggest using only a, a simple test to make that uh, decision, that this, these tests that are used are really only one part of a comprehensive evaluation. But here, just let me tell you about Dr. Baker's test, which was eventually called the BAQ, the Baker Alienation Questionnaire. So it, it's uh, what she did, she had a number of children that were referred for uh, therapy in a clinic. And these are all children whose parents are divorced. And some of the children were there because they needed to have reunification because they were uh, separated from a parent or they, they simply needed uh, counseling but not reunification therapy. So the implication is that the children who needed reunification therapy presumably had uh, alienation and the other children did not. So Dr. Baker administered this paper pencil test uh, there are only a few questions, there are 14 questions. Some of them are objective. For instance, the question was, do you enjoy spending time with your mother or father? And the answer is yes or no. And so that's, that's easy to score. That's an objective scoring of that particular question. Some of them are more complicated. Like the, one of the questions was, what are some things you don't like about your mother or that you don't like about your father? In any case, on the next slide, you can see the results. And that the children who were alienated, uh, that, it, that is, let me say the other one up. The children who were in reunification therapy scored as, as they were alienated, scored on this little questionnaire in the, in the uh, range of, a, of being alienated. While the children who were not involved with, alien, with reunification therapy did not score in that way. So, 
what it boils down to is this fairly simple test was pretty successful. It was 87.5% successful in distinguishing the alienated from the non-alienated children. So I'm just trying to give you some examples of tests that can be used to distinguish alienation from, from other situations. And that's the kind of thing that you have to have to uh, add something to the DSM. So I realize some of this is a little bit technical, but I hope it I hope it's of interest to y'all. And I hope that I hope that you, you you also feel that it would be good for this part to be included and and I hope that you will go to the website and endorse it so that we can add your name to the list of endorsers. Well, here I want to tell you a couple more of these tests. And this is the research that I did with my colleagues that was published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences a few years ago. And we used a different question. We used, uh, it was called the PARQ, the P-A-R-Q, the Parental Acceptance Question, the Parental Acceptance Rejection Questionnaire. And in the next slide, you can see the participants in this project. Um, and usually you have to put this kind of information when you publish a paper. But we had several categories of children. We had categories of children from an intact family uh, whose parents were divorced, a situation where one of the parents was absent. And then we had children who were alienated from their father and alienated from their mother. So in general, we had some children who were alienated from the parent and other children who were not alienated. And then we, we gave them this question, questionnaire, the PARQ, and here are a couple of examples of, of what's on this. For instance, some of, the, um, some of the questions are positive. Like this one says, my father says nice things about me. So that's a positive statement about father. And some of them are negative, like my father does not really love me. And, the, and it takes about 20, 25 minutes for the child to, um, to respond to this questionnaire. Now it's done on the computer just to make sure that it's done systematically. Um, and, and then it's also scored by a computer. But in any case, the next slide showed our results and that we found that alienated children engage in splitting. Now, that's been described for 30 years. There's nothing new about the idea that alienated children engage in splitting, which means that they say one parent is all good and the other parent is all evil. So there's nothing new with that. But this is the first time this research that my colleagues and I did was the first time that the splitting was measured in a quantitative manner. And if you look at this slide that says splitting occurs in alienated children, on the right-hand side, you see um, in if what this means is that if the children were alienated from their father, they had extremely negative views of their father and extremely positive views of their mother. And likewise, the reverse, if they were alienated from their mother, they had extremely negative views of their mother and extremely positive views of their father. So that is a very striking result from this research. And we had a name for this called the gap. In other words, when one parent is very, very high and the other parent is very, very low, we said that can be measured and that's the gap. And in the next slide, uh, talks about the park gap and how the park gap distinguished alienated from not alienated children. And, um, we don't need to get into all the details, but basically on the right-hand side, the children in red all had very, very, very high numbers for this gap score. And then on the left side, the children had low numbers. And this test, the PARQ, was, had an astounding result. It was 99% successful or 99% accurate in distinguishing alienated from non-alienated children. So it's that kind of research that I think will help us 
get this into the DSM. So there's one more test for children I want to tell you about by our colleagues in the United Kingdom, Blag and Godfrey. And they used a different test with a different group of children in a different country, and they had the same results. They used a test called the BAFRT, which stands for the Benet Anthony Family Relations Test. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but this test involved asking the children their opinion uh, about various family members and uh, other people that they might um, have a close contact with. And in the next slide is the results. It says the Benet Anthony Family Relations Test distinguishes alienated from non alienated children. And just, I'll tell you what these numbers mean. It, it means that if um, when the children were asked about the preferred parent or the favorite parent, they gave very, very positive opinions. And when they were asked about the targeted parent, they gave very, very negative opinions. So that's the same kind of result that's consistent with splitting. It's the same kind of result, um, but with using a different test. So I've just given you the Baker test, the PARQ, and now this Benet Anthony test. And all these pertain to children. In other words, all three of these are, are questionnaires or testing procedures that are used with the children. And now I want to tell you about one more way to distinguish alienated from not alienated children. And this has to do with a questionnaire that's given to the parents. And this is also pretty well known. Uh, the name of the paper was called Parental Alienation, a Measurement Tool by Gina Rowlands, a psychologist. And Dr. Rowlands developed this scale called the Rowlands Parental Alienation Scale, RPAS, and it was administered to a very large number of parents. And um, the scale had a number of different questions on it, but it was eventually reduced down to these six questions. Does your child engage in a campaign of denigration toward the alienated parent? Does your child manifest the independent thinker phenomenon? And so on. Another one was, does your child manifest the presence of borrowed scenarios? So these are the same eight um, questions that are actually part of the five-factor model. In other words, the five-factor model, factor five, are certain behaviors in the children, and these, the, 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 those behaviors in factor five are the same as these factors that are in the Rowland's questionnaire. So that's good. In other words, there's a huge amount of consistency there. So what did they find? What did Dr. Rowland's find? Her conclusion was the following, that if the parent was known to have been an alienated, an alienated parent, in other words, if, if a court made that decision or a court evaluator made that conclusion and confirmed the presence of parental alienation, those parents scored higher on all six of these factors than uh, situations where alienation was not present. In other words, they had cases determined by a court to involve alienation and other cases that it was absent. And the cases that involve alienation scored higher on this test than the others. So here, I have a couple more questions. Um, posed by audience members that I want to take a look at. So um, let's read this together. The diagnosis of parental alienation is just as accurate as an x-ray for a broken bone. What leg 
does the DSM-5 have to stand on to refuse its injunction? It's sort of a mixed metaphor here. <laughs> we're talking about having a broken bone, and then we're talking about what leg does the DSM have? So that's a good question. So the, the, the question here is, if we submit this proposal, what opposition will be considered? And I think there will be opposition that we have to think about. But here are the things that um, have been mentioned to me as might be something that the DSM people would be concerned about. First of all, the American Psych the Atric Association is, of course, a very large professional body. And the American Psychological Association is even larger. I mean, there are thousands of people who belong to these organizations. And big organizations frequently do not want to take on issues that are really controversial. And we know that this issue of parental alienation will be controversial. And in fact, when um, parental alienation was proposed when the DSM-5 first came out in 2013, that there were hundreds of comments on both sides of the question. I, I think the DSM people said that they received more comments regarding parental alienation than any other topic that was being considered at that time. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get a lot of endorsements. In other words, uh, I think I mentioned we already have more than 2,000 uh, individuals and organizations who uh, are supporting this. And by individuals, I mean practitioners, but also parents and grandparents. That if you, if you do sign up to be an endorser, you, you have to indicate, are you a practitioner or are you a uh, family or child advocate. And if you're a parent or a grandparent, you should check off that you're a family or child advocate. I mean, that's the category that we would put you in. And um, we're anticipating that once DSM um, starts looking at this, one of the things they do is they send it out for public comment. And so they will actually invite on their own people to sign in and say what they think about this proposal. And I'm, I'm hoping that many of you will do will also comment directly to the DSM, but I'm sure that there will be opponents who will send in their comments at that time. So anyway, uh, I think that's something we have to be concerned about because these organizations don't like to be in the center of a controversy because the, even within the organization, there are different opinions about what to do about a particular topic. And then the second concern is what's always raised by the people who uh, criticize parental alienation theory, that they are concerned that uh, a parental alienation diagnosis would be used by fathers who are abusive of their children as a way to escape responsibility. In other words, if there's a child who goes back and forth between mom and dad, the child doesn't want to go see dad anymore. And the mother says, oh, the child doesn't want to go see dad because he's abusive. And then the dad will say, no, the, the children don't want to come see me because they've been indoctrinated by their mother. And so you can see, and this is probably the most common objection to parental alienation is the idea that it might be abused by some parents to escape responsibility for abusing their children. Um, obviously, we don't want it to be used in that way. We want it to be diagnosed correctly. Uh, we think that if the criteria for parental alienation are in the DSM, that it will mean that uh, hopefully they'll be applied correctly and hopefully people will be diagnosed correctly rather than uh, in some incorrect manner. 
So another one, the possibility is they'll say that there's not enough research. Well, I think that's not really much of, uh, of a criticism because I don't think it's true. I think there, there are hundreds of published research um, articles on this topic. And, um, but I'm concerned that the DSM people might be very picky and will say, oh, only a handful of these really are relevant to what we're concerned about or something like that. So those are some criticisms that I'm concerned might come up when we submit this to the DSM. So let's look at the next question posed by one of you. It says, can you indicate parental alienation to be included as a subject required to get psychology graduation? Well, that's a really, that's a really important idea. In fact, that's, that's maybe the first reason why we're doing this. Why are we going to all this trouble to have parental alienation included or to have PARC included in the DSM-5? Is because we think that once that happens, more people will teach it, that it will be taught in uh, graduate school to uh, psychology students and social work students, that we taught taught in residency training for child psychiatrists and, and general psychiatrists. It will be taught, uh, hopefully, to child protection workers. In other words, if, if parental alienation is more obviously uh, called a form of child abuse, uh, child protection workers will need to learn about it. And even more important, it will be taught to law students and to judges. You know, judges get lots of training about topics, many, many topics, including this topic. And I think that if um, if it's in the DSM, the training for judges will be uh, more powerful. So here's another uh, question posed by somebody in the audience. I'm seeing more cases in which one parent is extremely hostile, verbally abusive, and blaming to the child without physical abuse. And the child resists contact with that parent. How will your proposal address recognizing the difference between such cases of estrangement and cases of alienation? So um, that is always a part of the diagnostic evaluation and to be able to distinguish estrangement, which is rejection of a parent for a good reason, and alienation, which is rejection for a parent without a good reason. And what this person wrote down here describes estrangement. In other words, a child would have a reason uh, to reject a parent who's extremely hostile, verbally abusive, blaming, and so on. Even though there is not physical abuse, this would constitute extremely um, poor parenting it, to the point where it would uh, it would come up under factor three. Factor three of the five-factor model is the absence of abuse, neglect, or highly deficient parenting on the part of the rejected parent. And I think what's being described here is highly deficient parenting. So there's another way uh, to word factor three which is something like this, is the child's rejection of the targeted parent far out of proportion to anything that that parent has done. So all parents make mistakes. All parents sometimes say the wrong thing or they do the wrong thing. And so you can see how uh, a very, very picky person might say, oh, that's enough reason for the child rejection, but it really isn't. In other words, what happens in alienation is the child's rejection is far out of proportion to anything that parent has done. In this case right here, that was um, in this question, I and mean, that seems to be a case of estrangement. And you can see how the child rejection might make sense if the parent behaves in that way. So it does not, uh, qualified for factor three of the five-factor model. Here's another question. 
uh, if the alienating parent and alienated children do not participate in any therapy or evaluation, how can DSM code be assigned? It has been the biggest challenge and I'm not sure how to best address it. So that does come up because sometimes uh, even if an evaluation is court order, sometimes the uh, favored parent or the alien 18 parent won't participate in the evaluation and won't bring the children. So general, as a general rule, it's not appropriate for an evaluator to have, have a, make a diagnosis of a person that they have not personally interviewed and not personally evaluated. Now, I realize occasionally that does happen. And forensic psychiatrists and psychologists do have opinions about people they have never seen. And that happens when the person is deceased. You know, for instance, suppose there is some sort of medical malpractice claim and the forensic psychiatrist or forensic uh, pathologist perhaps uh, might have to make a uh, conclusion about the patient's diagnosis and obviously the patient's deceased and they're not gonna interview that patient. Or occasionally in criminal cases, the prisoner totally refuses to have a conversation with the evaluator. So the evaluator might still need to express an opinion about the diagnosis. But I think in family law cases, the best way to do it is something like this, that even if the evaluator has not interviewed the uh, parent, the alienated parent, the evaluator can say something like the following. The activities of the favored parent are consistent with factor four of the five factor model. In other words, they're, they're not actually making the diagnosis, but they are able to say that such and such is consistent with the alienating behaviors that are listed in the five fa in factor four. Or they can make observations about the children's behaviors. They can say the behaviors of the child are consistent with factor five of the five factor model. So I think in court, the, the evaluator needs to be really, really honest about what he and she has done and what they have, who, whom they have interviewed and so on. But, um, and you have to say, I haven't really personally interviewed certain people, but you can still say that certain things, I can't make a diagnosis, but that certain things are consistent with, uh, with that kind of diagnosis. Okay, I think I have, I think I have one more question from the audience. Will you or your colleagues include children of all ages, including teenage children and adult children in references about victims of parental alienation? Children can be lost, disregarded, dismissed for a life and left in the control of the alienating person indefinitely and possibly lifelong with possibly life ending consequences. So um, we do talk about in the proposal, we talk about what are the possible bad effects of adding parental alienation to the DSM, I mean, they actually ask us that. And we will, and we say, well, a possible bad effect is that this, this diagnosis will be misused by some parents. And of course, we, we say that that can be mitigated by having good criteria. And, and if there are good criteria, it's gonna be harder to misuse the diagnosis. So that's a possible bad effect. Um, of adding PARP to the DSM. But they also asked, what are the possible bad effects of not adding PARP to the DSM? And we, in fact, talk about that. We talk about hundreds of thousands of children 
who have been cut off from a parent, who have experienced parentectomy. And that's a huge um, negative effect of, of this condition. And if it's not added, uh, do those children are less likely to be identified and help. And we already say something about how it continues into adult life. And we will, we'll, I think we'll strengthen that based on what this person has, um, has suggested that we can make that a bit, we can make that part a bit stronger, that this is one of the possible bad effects of not including PARP in the DSM, that um, it affects not only children, but teenagers, and adult children, and it, it can go on, it can go on forever. And it can have very, very sad consequences. <clears throat> it is sad, I mean, in, in, we actually mentioned this in our proposal that in extreme cases of parental alienation, you know, I talk about mild, moderate, severe. Well, there actually is one step beyond severe, which is extreme. And, and we know that there have been cases where people have died uh, as a result of parental alienation. Occasionally, the child or teenager uh, committed suicide. And occasionally, the targeted parent who has experienced enormous frustration um, has committed suicide. And I, I realize that I should have given you a heads up that I, I might mention something that is painful and I'm sure that it is, but we actually say this in the proposal and occasionally uh, people have been murdered. Uh, we know of two cases where the alienated child helped to kill, to murder the victim parent, the targeted parent. And there have been a number of cases where the alienating parent has killed the child in, or, in order to keep the child away from the uh, rejected parent. They, they, they take the child's life and then frequently kill themselves. So to, it's a murder-suicide. So, I mean, all this is horrible to think about and I'm sorry to bring this up sorry, in this way, but we actually say this in our proposal, we mentioned that these things sometimes happen in what we call extreme cases of parental alienation. And that's part of this discussion of what are the possible bad effects of including it and what are the possible bad effects of not including it. So that's the last question I want to talk about. In the next slide, I, I want to emphasize that you all can help us. I mean, this is a huge project. We started this in July and have had a number of different presentations and um, videos, and websites and so on. And we are going to submit this uh, to the committee. It's called the DSM um, by steering committee in November and only a few weeks from now. And we hope that uh, you can endorse our proposal. The way you do it um, is you go to that website I mentioned and um, there's a mechanism there for endorsing the proposal. So I, I mentioned we already have a couple thousand people and organizations. If you're a mental health professional, you can indicate that you're a practitioner and you indicate what your degree is in and you indicate whether or not you're affiliated with a university. If you are a parent or a grandparent, you can indicate that you are a child advocate or family advocate. If you are an organization, you actually, the, you, you need to contact uh, Dr. Jennifer Harmon and she's keeping track of organizations that are interested. But all this, it, it's all explained on the website. So you can help us make history if you want to see the entire proposal, you can go to the website, www.parp-dsm.info. And if you want to see the entire proposal, you'll find it there. 
the appendices are there. And if you want to endorse the proposal, there are links on the website to be able to do that. Uh, I'm also really interested in comments. I mean, some of the suggestions that were made here uh, are, are prompting uh, my co-author of the proposal, Dr. Baker and I are doing this together. And I think some of the comments, some of the those questions that were raised by you all um, have prompted us to make a few changes in the actual proposal. So we're welcome for that. If you if you do have comments about the proposal, or you want to make suggestions, or you want to make changes, uh, you can contact me, and my email is on this slide, but it's pretty simple. It's William Burnett, B E R N E T, at v u m c dot org, and v u m c stands for Vanderbilt University Medical Center dot org o r g. So I worked at Vanderbilt for a long time. I was on the full-time faculty for 20 years, and now I've been retired for 10 years. So I, I still have an office at Vanderbilt because I'm a professor emeritus. So um, I actually appreciate the support from Vanderbilt for this project. Finally, in the last slide, uh, has a little bit of information about the organization. I'm the president of the uh, Parental Alienation Study Group. And if you're interested in staying in touch or you're interested in more information about parental alienation, you're, um, um, you're welcome to uh, join the organization. And you, you do that, you go to the, the PASG website, which is www.pasg.info, I-N-F-O. As you all probably know, there are lots of websites and, and organizations and advocacy organizations that are now involved with uh, parental alienation. I think in our proposal, we're being endorsed by 40 or 50 advocacy organizations, and including Family Access, which we really, really appreciate. And these organizations have different missions. Family Access is extremely active in uh, communicating uh, information about parental alienation in a variety of ways, which they do through this webinar, through a television program, uh, through a, the web, their website, and, and conferences that occur every year. So uh, that's something Family Access is extremely successful at. PASG does other things. We have members who, who write articles for journals, we uh, put on uh, presentations, not only at our meeting, but at uh, meetings of professional organizations, such as psychiatric organizations and psychology organizations and social worker organizations. So I think it, it is useful. You, you could join a number of different organizations with regard to parental alienation and they, they, have, different, uh, they have different agendas and they have different missions and they're all helpful. So anyway, I, I hope I have given you some education about PARP, and I've given you some of the arguments that we use for why it should be included in DSM-5. And oh, this incidentally, I, one question that people ask, the DSM used to only be revised every few years. They would accumulate changes, and then in 10 years, they would publish a whole new DSM. They don't do that anymore that they consider new ideas on an ongoing basis. So that's why we're submitting our proposal in November. We hope it will be given out for public comment um, a few weeks after that. And we hope that it will be considered by the different parts of the American Psychiatric Association and that they will give us a final answer in a few months. We don't have to wait five years or 10 years for a whole new a uh, copy of DSM to be published. And what happens when something new is accepted by the DSM, they, uh, they, they make changes in the digital version, which is on the APA website. In other words, the digital version of the DSM-5 is the definitive version of, 
of the DSM, and we hope that we'll, we'll be included in that. And then after a few years, they eventually do publish a new hard copy, but we don't have to wait for that, for uh, PARP for PARP to be included in the digital version. Thank you very much for your attention this evening. I really appreciate it. Let me know personally if you have any questions or comments about our proposal. And uh, good night, and we wish you the best.